So let's just take a moment to pause and uh, I have one or two questions, but any questions of Jonathan or Gail? I have a comment. Okay, comment. And I'm, I appreciate everything that um, both of you have said, uh, but, and also getting to see these pictures in person, uh, some of which I've never seen, many of which I've never seen before. But I think to talk about uh, representation and indeed realism, which is a, a more freighted term, um, particularly in the 1950s, without mentioning why so many artists, I think, were motivated to abandon representation. And that is that this is the period of enormous fear of communism and accusations um, of communists under every rock by people like Senator uh, Joe McCarthy and uh, Representative Don Darrow and so forth. And it's also a time right before the civil rights movement heated up. And looking around, there's this marvelous painting, which didn't make it into the book, but is a um, Browning painting of a peace rally, which must be from circa 1969 with the peace symbol. Uh, this is an uh, anti-Vietnam war protest. Again, a, there a more politically uh, obvious uh, expression in her work. But um, just reading in your book, Philip, you do address Jeffrey Wagner's apology. Yeah, and Jeffrey was British. He wasn't American. Yeah, he was British. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Go but ahead. so, um, and again, I, I appreciate that Henry brought up um, feminism because, of course, feminist ideology ideas were not acceptable, and feminist art indeed was rejected. Uh, and ridiculed um, by the critics in power um, and by a lot of mainstream America when it first happened in the uh, late 60s, early 1970s. So communism, again, was something that was so threatening, couldn't be spoken about. And just the painting of the little African-American girl in the painting Holiday could be um, in the wrong hands um, used as political weapon against the artist uh, to marginalize. So I, I think this is just something we need it's to definitely think a very about and why some artists right. found it very convenient to paint abstractly. And there's been some very important research on the, that political role of uh, realist and abstract painting in, in the 50s. The other side of that coin, Gail, is that we know that uh, the USIA, all that research of uh, the USIA was using abstract painting and sending exhibits around in the 50s to sort of promote and to hail that America's freedom of expression uh, allows this type of anti-authoritarian painting in the light of the heavy-handed Stalinist social realist painting. So it's almost a double edge. Well, it's really the same thing, Philip, because there you have um, the U.S. government agreeing that abstract art is really better than representation, which can be threatening, right. yeah, with it as a threatening message. Uh, well, again, it's not so much... Uh, I, 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 I do think we have to be really... I mean, whenever you generalize, it's very tricky, and I, I don't want us to suddenly, or anyone in the audience, to suddenly sort of think, well, abstract expressionism somehow equals some kind of conservative politics. And I know that's not what you're saying, Gail, no. just that all these generalizations are really tricky. And I, I had the pleasure to interview George Tooker, who was a good friend of Colleen Browning, and their work is very closely connected. And one of the things that, that Tooker kept doing over and over again is he kept on trying to say is, I like abstract expressionist painting. I, I, do, I really didn't like the idea that people use my work to be against abstraction. So, so, uh, you know, what is so wonderful, and I agree so much with what Henry said, and, and I agree, um, you know, that Philip and, and Gail, too, I think actually all of us at this table have been so dedicated with the idea of bringing uh, focus on artists who have not been known for various reasons, and it's, it's unbelievably complex. I mean, there are lots of abstract painters who we don't know about. Um, my, my family is a a wonderful abstract expressionist who's very closely associated with Pittsburgh, Russell Twigg, that maybe some people know, and his work is virtually unknown in New York. So, you know, it's so complicated and so, um, and, and as an artist myself, so scary 
why some artists are, are remembered and other artists aren't. And sometimes artists themselves are the worst advocates for their own work. They undermine their own career. They do the wrong things, you know. Um, uh, you know, certainly, and, and certainly also uh, Colleen Browning had, as you've, you've pointed out, she was interestingly enough obviously to be filmed. She did a book on her teaching practices. She was a distinguished teacher during her lifetime. So she's not someone who was completely, you know, disappearing. She had a, a lot of people respected her and all the rest. So it's okay. complicated. Henry, last comment, and then we'll go to Gail's talk. Go ahead, Henry. The, I might just say that one aspect of Colleen Browning's work that's interesting that I skipped over because of time, but her sensitivity to new trends as she goes through her career, um, you know, to a Greenbergian, this would be a source of criticism. It gives her a sort of chameleon aspect, but she clearly was looking at the work of people like Warhol and Jasper Johns and the abstract expressionists and so forth. And I find that one of the things that's fascinating about her work is that it does provide a record of the fashions of the moment in an extraordinary way and, you know, what New York felt like in 1977. And she captures that very accurately in part because of lots of things, the way she captures fashions that are very ephemeral and all the fads that have disappeared and we've forgotten that they even existed. She was, a, she was very much a sponge of American and, trends. And, and, uh, and I do think that chameleon aspect also has to do with the very difficult role of women in that period if they were trying to form a strong creative identity. And you can see that she's grasping for different things to catch on to. Um, you know, in one way, none of them quite catapult her to fame, but I, th I think the whole record of changes becomes a very fascinating biography. Okay, well, we're going to hear about some other distinguished female painters now with Gail Levin's presentation. That's a perfect segue.